I am. Spanish Howitzer, cast in Barcelona, October 1792, when Charles IV was king. It was taken by the French in Catalonia. Le Défenseur, 24 caliber French cannon, cast in Strasbourg, February 4, 1758. The arms of the King of France have been erased, expunged by French revolutionaries. Bronze cannon, cast in 1742 at England's Woolwich Arsenal. Its reinforced bears King George II's coat of arms, crowned and bearing the Order of the Garter, and marked with the motto, Dieu et mon droit. Bavaro, number 1479. Tripolino, number 1473. Romulo, number 1535. Scipio, number 1538. Four Spanish cannon cast at the Arsenal of Sevilla in 1785 and 1786 when Charles III How can was so many guns at the time representing the height of heavy arms technology find themselves more than 4,000 miles from where they were made in a fortress perched atop a mountain? France, May 1801. Something is afoot in the French ports of Brest, Rochefort, Lorient, and Toulon. A massive army is mobilizing for reasons yet unknown. Soon the rumor spreads that an expedition is about to intervene in France's colonies in the Americas. In December 1801, orders are given for the troops to embark. 31,000 men took off to quell what at the time was thought to be a slave insurgency. Napoleon Bonaparte, first consul of France, after the 18 Brumaire coup d'état, sent his best generals to lead this expedition. The ships are commanded by admirals Villarin de Joyeuse and de la Touche Tréville. Bonaparte's brother-in-law, Victor Emmanuel Leclerc, is at the head of the troops, traveling with his wife, Pauline Bonaparte, and their son, Dermide, age four. After a 4,000-mile journey over the Atlantic, the army landed at Saint-Domingue, France's most significant and richest colony in the Americas. In 1697, the Treaty of Ryswick ceded to France the western third of Hispaniola, a Caribbean island belonging to Spain. French occupation of Saint-Domingue was focused on a plantation economy. L'exclusive or exclusive colonial trade with the metropole was then applied. In the mid-18th century, Saint-Domingue was France's richest and most prosperous colony. It produced more sugar than all English colonies put together and 40% of the world's coffee. Saint-Domingue was ruled by the Code Noir, or Black Code, which created rigid caste-like hierarchies within its society. Its prodigious wealth was created by the mass amount of goods produced mainly by slave labor. In the 1700s, nearly one million people were taken by force from Africa to Saint-Domingue in the lucrative slave trade. This labor force grew and processed sugarcane and coffee on vast plantations. Slaves were the property of plantation owners. In their lives, a true reign of terror prevailed against any attempt to rebel and held slaves down in a state of absolute servitude. 
Colonialists frustrated by the exclusive restrictions, free people of color subjected to the discriminatory code, and 500,000 slaves brutally bound in abject conditions launched the colony on the irreversible course of history. At the close of the 18th century, Saint-Domingue was about to explode. In August 1789, French revolutionaries declared, all men are born and remain equal in rights. This revolution rang out, electrifying the slaves who then started a rebellion. On the night of August 21st, 1791, slaves on the rich Northern Plains sugar plantations called for a general insurrection. 1,000 plantation owners slaughtered, 160 sugar plantations, and 1,200 coffee plantations burned down, causing six million pounds in damages, a de facto abolition of slavery that became official in 1793 as the Spanish, then the British, invaded the colony. Chaos reigned, and then came Toussaint Louverture. Born a slave on Breda Plantation, Toussaint joined the rebellion early on. Then he joined the French army. A masterful military strategist, he brought victory to France, expulsing the Spanish and the British. He was promoted to Chief General of Saint-Domingue's army, then Governor General, ruling the colony. His 1801 constitution brought autonomy, essentially an emancipation from France. It also abolished slavery for good, creating an egalitarian society. This made Toussaint's constitution the first step toward independence. In response to these sweeping measures, Napoleon chose to send troops to Saint-Domingue to reinstitute slavery and re-establish French sovereignty. Saint-Domingue, February 1802. The ships of Captain General Leclerc's army circled the island, disembarking at several points. Following a horrific war replete with memorable military exploits, and although the Armée Indigène, or indigenous rebel forces, were at a heavy disadvantage in weapons and supplies, and having lost their commander, Toussaint Louverture, deported to France, the revolutionaries won the War of Independence after the Battle of Vertier on November 18, 1803. January the 1st, 1804, a new day has dawned on the former colony. Jean-Jacques Dessalines, commander-in-chief of the victorious army, proclaimed independence with his generals by his side. And to underscore their triumph and its irreversibility, he named the new nation Haiti, as did the Tainos, the island's first inhabitants. Having won their freedom, Haitians now faced new challenges, create a new social order, create a new economic system, forge a new state. The return of enemy French troops loomed. A set of measures were at once put in place in case of attack. Remove the populations from postal areas. At the sound of the first cannon shot, the towns disappear and the nation will take its stand. Army Command Headquarters is moved inland to the new nation's capital of Marchand. In April 1804, Dessalines ordered division generals to build defense structures at the tops of the highest mountains, at the places overlooking roads leading to inlying areas. This was a massive undertaking aimed at marking off the newly conquered land. Thus was developed a strategic system of military buildings, forts, batteries, redoubts, lookouts, outposts, sentry boxes. Among these were the forts Bonnet Carré, Marfran, Platon, Garit, Les Bois, Campan, Auger, Jacques, Alexandre, Drouet, Delpeche, Bequet, Oranger, Bayonnet, Jalousière, Neuf, Dahomey, Culbuté, Décidé, Madame, Innocent, Doco, Fin du Monde. This system includes no less than 30 such forts covering the whole country. And of them all, one stands out, the citadel.
General Henri Christophe, commanding the country's northern area, went beyond Dessalines' April 1804 decree by building on the Bonnet à l'Evêque peak a monumental fortress, a mountain atop of the mountain. To complete this astonishing construction nearly 3,000 feet above sea level, Henri Christophe used strategies that as yet had been unknown and he invented. He invented curtain walls and tiered bastions, a bold synthesis of classical applications between the bastioned military forts by the Marquis de Vauban and recent theories on vertical fortification developed by the Marquis de Montalembert. He crowned the dizzying La Ferrière mountain peak with an immense four-sided structure covering nearly 130,000 square feet. He built his citadel on rocky gables with foundations 16 feet thick. Christophe achieved the feat of adapting the fortress to the rough ground beneath it and to the rocky spine on which it is elevated, combining startling boldness in construction with consummate knowledge of military defense. He built bastion towers, one of which, called Quad David, soars to more than 130 feet. The breathtaking Quad David bastion bestows a majesty, both a defensive feature and a manifestation of power. At the top of a sheer cliff, he perched Grand Bouquin Bastion, Marie-Louise Battery, and Presse Royale Battery. Christophe built powder magazines to store thousands of barrels of gunpowder, thereby providing the fortress with significant firepower. He put 20,000 men and women to work, recruited throughout the north. The size of the worksite was unheard of. A complex supply network had to be put in place. Christophe prospected for clay mines exploited in the making of hundreds of thousands of bricks, slabs, and roof tiles. He built immense lime kilns needed to make mortar used in preparing more than 5 million cubic feet of stone masonry. He reopened old colonial plantations to grow food for his workers. He had an unbelievable 360 tons of heavy artillery hauled to the height of 3,000 feet up the mountain. Following that, he transported projectiles of all kinds, cannonballs, bombs, explosive shells, grenades, more than 50,000 pieces. He built within the citadel's walls a large parade ground where troops were to be reviewed. He housed a palace, the governor's palace, surprisingly a civil building amongst the powerful masses of military structures. Facing the city of Le Cap, this palace overlooks the valleys and the plains, delineates the coast. Like a lookout, it signals the presence of approaching enemy ships. For his officers, he furnished a mess hall, the officers' quarters, equipped with parlors, a mess, a kitchen, and bread ovens. He installed lodgings for the troops, jails, blacksmith's forges, kitchens, enormous warehouses for food storage. He completed his fortress with all the essentials for making war and for resisting long sieges. And this endless suite of fortified gun houses set along curtained walls and bastions and housing heavy artillery. Equipped with firing slits, they covered the surrounding landscape. To complete his fortress's defenses on the southern side, making it absolutely impregnable, he had four more buildings erected, the Ramier Redoubts. Serving as lookouts and defenses, these redoubts were armed with cannon and mortars on all four sides and were surrounded by moats. With the fortified site of Ramier and with his citadel, Henri Christophe created a military complex as monumental in scale as the environing landscape. Thank mm -hmm. you.
Stuff has started out as a chef. This perhaps helped him develop his considerable skills as an organizer. He knew how to foresee and to plan. He also excelled as a leader. Born on the island of Grenada, he was just a child when he arrived in Saint-Domingue's city of Cap Français. Apprenticed in an inn, he eventually became a chef. He is later found in the French Chasseurs Royaux under Vice Admiral Destin, fighting alongside American revolutionaries. And so, Christophe was at the Siege of Savannah, where oral tradition says he was wounded. Returning to Cap Francais, he set up shop as an innkeeper and master butcher, and was later the chef at the Couronne, the hotel known as Crown. In 1793, he was a chef de brigade, or colonel, in France's Saint-Domingue army, and commanded Cap Francais and Fort Liberté in 1798. He joined the Armée Indigène, then the new Haitian army. After Dessalines was assassinated in 1806, he was elected president of Haiti and designated commander of ground and naval forces. Not satisfied with the powers conferred by the Constitution, he refused and retired to the north with his loyal troops. On June 2, 1811, he had himself crowned King of Haiti under the name of Henri Premier. Nationalistic and bold, a visionary and a military chief, often ill-tempered and impulsive, indeed a megalomania, Christophe was also exceptional at achieving outstanding results. A construction enthusiast, he built several palaces, the most elegant and opulent of which is Sans Souci in Milo, a village in the foothills of the Bonnet à l'Evêque Peak, beneath his citadel. On August 15, 1820, he had a massive stroke. When this became known, an uprising was soon to follow. Ill and betrayed by his own guard, he committed suicide on October 8, 1820. His body was taken by night by friends and family and buried in the citadel. When the king died, the citadel was plundered, then abandoned. In a state of neglect, Citadel Henri survived only because it was so solid and so isolated. For the past half century, Haitians have been restoring their citadel. Significant work was done between 1980 and 1990 with support from UNESCO. In 1982, Citadel Henri, the Ramier Forts, and the ruins of Sans Souci Palace were included in a historic national park measuring 10.5 square miles. In the same year, the park was registered by UNESCO on the World Heritage List as recommended by the International Council on Monuments and Sites. After these works, the citadel, preserved from danger, has become an international attraction as the largest fort in the Caribbean and the world's richest collection of 18th century artillery. It includes rare pieces, some of which are the only ones left in the world. Bagnodeur, gilded bronze, 24 caliber cannon, cast in Douai, France in 1700. It is part of King Louis XIV's artillery and weighs over two tons. 12 and 1 half inch sea service mortar with an ovoid breech decorated in the Baroque style, ornamented with the collars of the Order of the Holy Spirit and the Order of St. Michael. This bronze cannon was cast in Rochefort in 1743. 24 caliber English cannon cast in bronze in 1719 when George II was king. It bears the coat of arms of England. On its reinforced are the quarterly arms surrounded by the collar of the Order of Garter of Sir John Churchill, first Duke of Marlborough, and the motto. The artillery pieces in the Citadel Henri and the Ramier Forts were seized from Leclerc's French Expeditionary Army in 1802. The victors artfully arranged them in the massive fortress, citing the possible return of the French as an excuse, far exceeding the orders of Dessalines' April 1804 decree, Henri Christophe erected a monument, essentially to bring to their feet a people that the brutalities of slavery had brought to their knees. Henri Christophe made of his citadel a museum and a memorial, displaying the weapons seized from the enemy, exhibited with refined aesthetic sense. 
he passed on to the Haitian people their common heritage. He understood that pride was not a mere matter of words. He saw the need for sweeping symbols. With the citadel, Christophe brought the soul of the Haitian people to its proper and great heights. He built a monument that preserves hard-won freedoms and transcends the ages. Salina Cruz